Next up for us is the urinary system. I don't know if I mentioned it, but the urinary system is the toughest system in AMB2. Our major areas that we're going to start with are why does the urinary system matter? We'll go through the major functions right here, urinary anatomy, the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney, and then we'll finish up on urinalysis. I don't know if I've mentioned it, but the urinary system is the most difficult system in AMP2. I should clarify that it's both electrolytes and the urinary system together. So if you want to work on your different levels of thinking and work on your mastery skills, the urinary system and electrolytes are really good systems to work on. And I don't know if I mentioned it before, but the urinary system is the most difficult system in AMP2. That was the last one. Probably. Broad view again, the urinary system does have some simple anatomy, but then things get deeper. And when we start into the functional unit of the kidney, the nephron things get pretty complex. Our major areas again are, we're going to start with some specific examples of why the urinary system matters. We'll go through major functions, then urinary anatomy, then the nephron. We'll finish with your analysis. So notice the blank area here, which is normally kind of just basic fact-based knowledge. If I zoom out a little bit, it is here. We're just going to go through the big ideas and we're moving them out into higher thinking. So we'll start with some examples of evaluating how the urinary system can fail. Many of these examples are from former students. This will also be on the test. It's a test question for you to come up with connections where one fault in the system causes a lot of changes. That is, that is what evaluation is, knowing how things are going to change when there's a change from normal. Some intro slides. I always like to start with some art, just to emphasize that creativity means finding connections that others don't see, but connections that do, in fact, make sense. This is true in art, and it's true in science. You might make some incorrect connections here about this picture, but this is an artist's rendition of the first catheterization. Do you think it started with a, hey, I have an idea, let's try this. Lame joke. Urinary system must not do much since you can live without them. That's not true. You can't live without your kidneys. They can be in failure. But you can't really live without them completely because they do some important things. Really only gets rid of waste products. Probably does more than I think. I think you should be thinking C. Probably does more than you think. Why is the urinary system so challenging? Because it controls fluid and electrolytes. Fluid and electrolytes affect the body's electricity, which means it affects neurons, the heart, muscle, and then the respiratory system since the respiratory system needs muscle. Then the respiratory system can change acid with CO2, which can change electrolytes and fluid. So fluid and electrolytes affect the body's electricity, which means it affects neurons, the heart, muscle, and then the respiratory system. And since the respiratory system needs muscle, the respiratory system can change acid, which can change electrolytes. I'm just kidding, jumping down here, getting a little circular. Things do get kind of circular, especially when one thing goes wrong, it can cause a lot of things to go wrong. And then those things can feed back in a positive feedback way and cause more things to go wrong. Going to cover things like sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. How many times have those come up in AMP2? And blood pressure. How often has that come up? So we'll go through some of these examples like Terry Schiavo as well. Anyway, that's the why. All right, so a lot of these are student generated. So we'll write these out on the board, and that's probably the better place to get this information. This particular connection came to a former student whose dad had spicy Mexican food. Pancheros is probably not the best example of that, but it will do. The spicy food, as it does, irritated his GI. This led to diarrhea. The diarrhea led to dehydration. Her dad then went into cardiac arrest and passed away. Now, the dehydration alone would not be expected to cause arrest in a healthy individual. But someone with a weakened heart, the loss of water concentrates potassium. We learned from ECG that high potassium will slow repolarization. Slow repolarization extends the QT. Long QT can cause cells to stay active even while neighboring cells come out of refraction. These neighboring cells then become pacemakers, they become ectopic pacemakers. The ectopic pacemaker then sends the heart into ventricular fibrillation and arrest. So one of the difficulties of the urinary system is you have to go back all the way into AMP1 and AMP2, everything in AMP2, to make sense of it. So we talked about EKG, long QT, high potassium when we did EKG. Michael Jackson took propofol. Propofol decreases respiration. Decreased respiration causes a buildup of CO2. Increased CO2 leads to respiratory acidosis. Acidosis leads to hyperkalemia by process we'll cover in the pH lecture. Hyperkalemia leads to, just as with the previous example, slowed repolarization, long QT, ectopic pacemakers, and then V-fib, causing cardiac arrest. Bulimia leads to a condition similar to the two previous, except that it's the direct opposite. By opposite, I mean Michael Jackson's heart would have contracted 
and had difficulty relaxing. In Terry Schiavo's case, the heart would have had difficulty contracting. In both cases, blood is not being pumped, so there's cardiac arrest. This is just a possible interpretation that I gathered from news reports at the time. It was reported that Terry Schiavo was perhaps bulimic. By throwing up often, she lost a pool of acid in her stomach. This made her have a higher pH, a condition called metabolic alkalosis. Whereas high acid causes hyperkalemia, low acid causes hypokalemia. Low potassium causes potassium to leave cells and hyperpolarizes them. A hyperpolarized AR cell will not stimulate the heart to beat, and so the heart stops. We'll come back to this one at the end of electrolytes. Jennifer Strange was in a water drinking contest. There are a number of directions we could go in, but maybe the easiest is too much water leads to hypokalemia that leads to hyperpolarization of cells that leads to difficulty having AR cells depolarize, which leads to heart unable to contract, which leads to cardiac arrest. Again, this is one of those where it's going to be easier to draw this out on the board or draw those out in a sequence with one arrow leading to the next and try and figure out how each of those steps are occurring. This was a student example. Her aunt had recently had gastric bypass and lost weight rapidly. When you lose weight rapidly, fat cells are going to release their contents and release a bunch of potassium. This leads to hyperkalemia, which leads to the same situation as Michael Jackson. Hyperkalemia leads to slowed repolarization, long QT, ectopic pacemakers, V-fib, and cardiac arrest. This was another student's connection. Her brother was 18, had brain cancer, and they were aggressively treating him with chemotherapy. Before he passed, they tried dialysis. The student was confused about the last few events of her brother's life. Why the dialysis? The likely scenario is that the chemo killed a lot of cells. Dead cells released potassium. Dialysis was tried to get the potassium back down. The hyperkalemia led to slowed repolarization, long QT, ectopic pacemakers, and VFib. So it was awful confusing for her, the dialysis, but also how her 18-year-old brother died of cardiac arrest when the original problem was brain cancer. In pancreatitis, the pancreas can be blocked from releasing its enzymes into the small intestine by a gallstone. While many of the stronger enzymes of the pancreas are inactive until they make it into the small intestine, some of the weaker ones are actually active. So if these enzymes start building up, they start digesting the pancreas. And if the enzymes get through a blood vessel and spread into the circulation, multiple cells in the body can be killed. Think about that. You've got digestive enzymes circulating in the blood, digesting things as if it was steak. When those cells are killed, they release potassium. I think you can probably finish the story now because we have increased potassium, and that's also what we had in multiple other cases that we just covered. So another one that you can think about is burns. When a person has burns, the first threat to life is the loss of fluid. The problem with the loss of fluid is it's often coupled with damaged tissue, which is releasing potassium as well. So there's less fluid as dead cells are also releasing potassium. So it really drives up potassium. This one is still puzzling. If you work in a geriatric care center, you might have heard the suspicion that sudden onset of delirium might be caused by a UTI. Now, delirium is a short term, whereas dementia is a long term change in mental function. So delirium is short term. The hypothesis is that the bacteria creates many metabolites in the urine, and these metabolites draw fluid. Losing fluid causes dehydration, and then dehydration concentrates ions in the body. A sudden increase in concentration of things like sodium and potassium and the brain will alter neuronal function, leading to the delirium. There's another theory that the infection causes a subconscious pain that leads to the delirium. I just think it's amazing that we're still stumped by these things. Hopefully, you'll come out of this section with a healthy respect for the IV. This is especially important if you're going into nursing, of course. But it matters, too, if someone you love is in the hospital bed. I won't go into this one in detail. But... The student whose aunt had bypass surgery, she also had another situation where she was in the room when a patient received a 24-hour IV in an hour, so received a whole bunch of potassium way too fast. There wasn't a family member in the room, and so the hospital was basically able to kind of cover up for this as best they could. So if you or a loved one is in a hospital bed, you kind of want to respect that IV too. We'll make this point over and over, but a lot of the conditions I went through were due to an imbalance of potassium. So sodium is even more powerful, but you have more mechanisms to deal with sodium imbalances. Also, in order to prioritize control of sodium, the body has to give up some of its control of potassium. This comes down to the simple fact that when the body wants to keep sodium, it has to get rid of potassium because it uses the same sodium-potassium transporter we learned about when we covered neurophysiology. 
in that example, the transporter pumps sodium out and pulls potassium back in. Same thing here. When you want to pump sodium back into the blood, you have to pump potassium into the urine or filtrate. So essentially, if you want sodium to come back into the body from the urine, it needs to put potassium into the filtrate or urine. I like to talk to former students and ask how my A&P class is preparing them for their later courses. I often will get emails. This is not my most favorite email because it's not necessarily the most kinding or flowing, or I don't think this particular student was completely enamored with me, which is what I normally like. Just kidding. But undoubtedly, the most difficult topic students come back to me with is fluid and electrolytes is the challenge. When you see the charts that are coming up, you're going to hate me now, but you'll probably appreciate me later. And again, I'm going to say that that holds true, whether you're going into nursing or understanding electrolytes can really help you kind of lead a more comfortable life as far as dealing with cramps and muscle fatigue and things like that. Electrolytes are pretty important to understand, even if you're not going into healthcare or in, into nursing. Another reason to respect the urinary system is that it contains the best examples of homeostasis. When we talk about homeostasis, we often use body temperature or blood sugar as the example. But by far the most important examples of homeostasis are electrolytes. pH varies by the least in your body because there's such a cluster mess when it's out of balance. Sodium and potassium are probably next. So given the AMP and healthcare are essentially about homeostasis and balance, the urinary system is the best example of this key idea in AMP and healthcare. As an example, Think of the homeostasis charts we used with blood glucose. The pancreas released insulin when blood glucose got too high and glucagon when blood sugar was too low. Take a look at the homeostasis diagram for sodium. And the middle is what we're trying to keep in homeostasis, in this case, sodium. On the top of the sheet are the things that deal with too much sodium. And the bottom of the sheet is when sodium is too low. I've also added things like causes. So what causes hypernatremia? What causes hyponatremia? I've listed out some of the effects of too high or too low. You might also look in the lower left to see things that sodium has controlled in our studies in AMP1 and AMP2. Here's a close-up of all those things sodium has done. It plays a role in action potentials, in neurons, and in muscle. It kicks off the cardiac muscle action potential, so it opens first in the cardiac muscle action potential, and also sets the pace of the heart in the autorhythmic cells. Sodium with the help of potassium and the sodium potassium ATPase will depolarize cells. Sodium can sometimes come back into cells if it brings glucose with it or if it kicks out calcium. Baroreceptors that sense blood pressure are essentially sodium receptors. The rest of the things around the circle will come up in the next two units, so like macula densa cells, sends sodium to know if the kidneys are keeping too much sodium or getting rid of too much sodium. The hypothalamus senses sodium to stimulate thirst. Fluid levels by the pituitary also sense sodium. Lastly, much of the mechanisms that keep us from urinating out things like calcium and amino acids is driven by sodium. So if sodium is not in balance, the kidneys won't keep the things they should keep or will not get rid of the things it should get rid of. So sodium is pretty important. Here's where you can see why the body cares more about sodium. While potassium is still important in action potentials and pacemaker potentials of the heart, potassium doesn't do near as much as sodium. One thing over here to keep in mind, though, is that acid base does have an effect on potassium, and potassium has an effect on acid base. Here you can see why that can be a weakness. So since sodium is important, the body has many methods to deal with breakdowns in the homeostasis of sodium. So the sodium chart was much more filled in as far as mechanisms to deal with too high of sodium, mechanisms to deal with too low of sodium. So there are not as many mechanisms for potassium. And this is why many of the examples that we gave at the beginning of this lecture come down to imbalances of potassium. So this one is just to create that contrast. This one's sodium, that one was potassium. So sodium, there's a lot going on with sodium. Your body has figured out that it has to maintain sodium. When we get to the electrolytes lecture, we'll add blood pressure, calcium, pure water, and also pH. So we'll have six of these charts. Before we leave the part about where we talk about why the kidneys are so important, let's talk about fluid. So fluid will move throughout the body and alter electrolyte concentrations. That fluid on its own can cause damage as in lymphedema and changes in blood pressure. Also, though, think about cell swelling or shrinking. A point I like to make is that if you have 400,000 chemical reactions per cell per second, swelling or shrinking of a cell is going to affect those chemical reactions. So a chemical reaction 
is some molecule A meeting another molecule B and having a chemical reaction interacting. So if a cell is bigger than normal, A and B are further apart, and so the chemical reactions will slow down. If a cell shrinks, A and B are now closer together, and so chemical reactions speed up. At 400,000 chemical reactions per cell per second, you can't really mess with the rates of chemical reactions much without causing some lethal consequences. So since electrolytes and fluids can change the size of cells, they're also very important in making sure that all the chemical reactions in the body are in homeostasis. Common number cited for the rate of chemical reactions in the body is 400 billion per second. If a cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, what would happen to the rate of chemical reactions? So hypertonic means it's more concentrated outside the cell. Water moves towards concentration, so water is going to leave this cell, which means the cell is going to shrink. A and B are going to be closer together, so the chemical reactions would speed up. So I like B here. Major functions of the urinary system. So we just went through all these examples that hopefully conveyed that the kidney does some pretty major things. It does some important minor things too. They're on the back of the infographic I handed out and we'll come to it in a second. A key fact to keep in mind that I think emphasizes how important the kidneys are is that while the kidneys are four tenths of a percent of the body weight, they get 25% of the blood. They get this much blood because it's their job to watch the blood for problems. Approximately 25% of blood leaving the heart will pass through the kidney. Such a high rate of kidney flow is most likely to accommodate. It's probably not removal of waste because you can go days without having dialysis, two, three days. The quickest way to maintain a normal pH is via the kidneys. That is going to be important, but it's kind of slow. The leading cause of death in those with kidney disease is cardiovascular disease. I'm starting to like that one. This indicates that a major reason for high volume of blood through the kidneys is to maintain fluid and electrolyte levels. So again, think about how often sodium, potassium, and calcium have done something in the body. Controlled heart rate, controlled heart strength, neurons, neuromuscular physiology, things like that. So you need to maintain electrolytes. Because the kidney is also the homeostatic center for oxygen saturation, um, that's probably a good one. But I don't think the kidneys affect hypoxia that much. That's going to be much more the respiratory system. So that one's a, a second place. This is the backside of the large infographic on the nephron. The five major kidney functions are reviewed as well as basic kidney anatomy. I should mention that I was making these large diagrams before there was a big wave of making infographics. They've gotten kind of popular. So I feel I should use that term kind of lightly because they aren't very beautiful infographics, that's for sure. I do need to pretty mine up a lot given how prominent these infographics have become, but I'm busy making these Prezi graphics and videos, so I'll get to them someday. Someday I'll make pretty infographics. The kidneys make three major hormones. I think we'll just talk it through on the infographic. So first, EPO, or erythropoietin, is released by the kidney when it senses decreased oxygen carrying capacity. It sends EPO to the bone marrow, and the bone marrow says, hey, make me some more red blood cells, and that increases oxygen carrying capacity. Vitamin D, it's made by the skin, but it's not actually in its active form until it goes through the kidney. Once it goes through the kidney, that's when it starts doing the things that it needs to do to increase calcium concentration. So it takes calcium out of bone, absorbs more calcium from the food in the gut, and also makes sure that the kidneys don't lose any more calcium than they have to. The last one, we haven't really covered this one yet. We have covered EPO. Vitamin D and calcitonin was an AMP1. Renin is an important hormone that helps the kidneys to regulate blood pressure. We're going to talk about that in detail soon. Regulation of pH. We're going to come back to this when we get to acidosis. So essentially the kidneys in part of this equation, this is a slide from later, so you don't necessarily need to memorize it yet until we get to pH. But when there's an excess of acid, the kidney can raise pH by making more base, which is bicarbonate, and making sure the kidneys don't lose any bicarbonate. When pH is too high, the kidneys can get rid of bicarbonate. So the kidneys will play a role in pH buffering. Maintenance of ions is obviously pretty important. So I would argue that this is the most important function that the kidneys do is regulate ion balance. In fact, when I'm reading a textbook for the first time and the book says that the main thing the kidneys do is get rid of waste products, I know the author doesn't understand the why of physiology or hasn't invested in why things matter. You can go days without dialysis because it takes days to build up enough toxins to be really toxic. That's why if you're on dialysis, you go every two or three days. So if the kidneys were mainly getting rid of toxins, they wouldn't be getting 25% of your blood per minute. The kidneys get this much blood so they can monitor the blood for imbalances of electrolytes and fluids. 
If you have a decrease in kidney function, I've mentioned this before, you're five times as likely to die of cardiac arrest because what the kidneys are really doing is controlling electrolytes to prevent problems with the heart, brain, muscles, which rely on those electrolytes. If you're not balancing those electrolytes, you're more likely to go into cardiac arrest. The kidneys do get rid of waste products. So removal of waste products might include byproducts of metabolism like creatinine and urea, or these waste products might be things that we consume that are not natural to our body like saccharin or sodium benzoate. Kidneys also regulate fluid, so regulate blood pressure. Regulating fluid overlaps a bit with controlling electrolytes, but should be treated separately. So, for example, if the kidneys fail and lose too much protein, there will be less protein to make albumin. Do you remember albumin from when we talked about capillaries? It's okay if you don't, because we'll come back to this again. But essentially, albumin creates the osmotic force that pulls fluid back into capillaries. So the kidneys can have effects on fluid apart from their control of electrolytes. If they lose protein, they lose albumin, don't have enough albumin to draw fluid back into the capillaries, and you're going to get edema. If blood pressure is too low, your brain doesn't get nutrition. If blood pressure is too high, blood vessels can be damaged or edema will result. So maintaining fluid volume is the last thing the kidneys are doing. Which of the following statements about the urinary system are incorrect? It carries out the majority of gluconeogenesis. That's making glucose, and that's mainly done by the liver. The liver stores glucose as glycogen and then can reproduce the glucose when it's necessary. But an interesting thing is the organ that's the second most likely to go through gluconeogenesis is the kidney. The kidney needs to make glucose and ATP as well. Pound for pound, the kidney's using more ATP than any other organ in the body. It produces renin that helps regulate blood pressure. I like that one. That's correct. Metabolizes vitamin D, we did say that. Produces EPO, that is the hormone that's released by the kidney when blood oxygen levels are too low. So I do like D. The one that's incorrect is A. The kidney does do gluconeogenesis, but it's second to the liver. But even the fact that it's doing gluconeogenesis means it's an organ that uses a lot of ATP. We'll do this in lab too, but understanding the urinary system allows us to look for other problems in the body, like when something's killing blood cells, that'll show up in the urinalysis. Or when the common bile duct is blocked, that can also be picked out by the constituents of urine. That one's interesting. What's going on in the gallbladder and the common bile duct can be reported by the urine. It's a bit like doing a blood test without the needle, which I like. I don't like needles. We'll cover basic anatomy in this next section coming up. All right, so we'll cover the basic anatomy of the urinary system. The ureters carry urine from the kidneys down to the urinary bladder. The urethra carries urine from the bladder out of the body during urination. The kidney sits encased by the inferior ribs along the posterior abdominal wall and they're retroperitoneal which means they lie outside the visceral peritoneum. So they're not in the same sac as the small intestine. They're outside of that peritoneum. We can divide the kidney up into three regions. The cortex in orange, which is superficial and looks kind of granular because there's these things called glomeruli. The medulla in yellow, which is the middle and exhibits pyramids, and the renal pelvis, an accumulation of funnel-shaped tubes that lead into the ureter shown in green. In the drawing system of the pelvis, we have major calyces. Those are in yellow. And then the minor calyces are in the pelvis where, again, these tubules start to consolidate urine for the ureters. The ureters are slender tubes that take urine to the bladder. An important thing that will come up later is that the ureters enter the bladder inferiorly and posteriorly. The ureters are made of transitional epithelia so that the tubes can stretch and still maintain a barrier. Remember transitional epithelia? Ureters also contain smooth muscle to propel urine towards the bladder through peristalsis. The bladder is muscular and collapsible. The triangular area made up by the two ureters and the urethra is called the trigone. There'll be a picture coming up. The trigone is really important clinically because the urinary tract infections tend to. The trigone is clinically important because urinary tract infections tend to persist here and allow bacteria in the bladder to go into the ureters and up to the kidneys. So the trigone is shown here in the triangle. This is why somebody should take the urinary tract infection. This is why you should take a urinary tract infection seriously because it can easily become a kidney infection. The kidney is easily damaged by additional fluid that arises from inflammation caused by infection. And we'll do some examples of that. 
when we cover that in lab, you'll see what tuberculosis does to the kidney or what hypertension does to the kidney. Suffice it to say, remember the simple cuboidal tubes that make up the kidney, they're not that strong. And so if there's additional fluid in the kidneys, it destroys those tubules and it destroys parts of the kidney. So extra fluid in the kidneys, not a good thing. You don't want a UTI to become a kidney infection. The bladder is lined by transitional epithelia as well. This allows the bladder to distend and collapse as necessary. So the bladder expands without a significant increase in pressure. The trusser muscles can squeeze the bladder in urination. Two sphincters will control the exit of urine. When the bladder is full, the internal sphincter will relax, releasing a small amount of urine that will then signal to the brain the need for urination. The external sphincter is under voluntary control, and that will be released when the person wants to urinate. More information on the urethra will be covered when we get to the reproductive system. While it has different names in males, I mean, as it goes through different regions, it takes up different names. It's simply a tube that conveys urine from the bladder to the outside world. Arrange the following structures in the correct sequence in which urine passes through them to the external environment. I would say it's got to start in the, not in the bladder. Let's say, let's go with minor calyx, then the renal pelvis, then the ureter, then the bladder, then the urethra. What order was that? C, B, A, D, E. C, A, B, D, E. How's urinary anatomy? The functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. It's a complex structure, looking at this image, with a lot of parts and a lot of functions. It takes an entire page of paper to represent the functions of the nephron. Recall that we can get a lot of the immune system or cardiovascular system on a sheet of paper. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to the nephron. So we did the whole cardiovascular system on a sheet of paper. Now we got to do this one functional unit of the kidney on a sheet of paper. So there's a lot of detail here. We're going to start at the top right and work our way around counterclockwise. Each system builds on another. So it's hard to get it all if you sit down in just a few sessions and try to cram all of it in. You can't cram this stuff. You need for the information from one area to settle in and make sense before you can move on to the next part. So this first part at the top, GFR, you kind of have to understand GFR before you move over to proximal convoluted tubule then the loop of Henle, then the distal convoluted tubule, then the collecting duct. Let's first consider the kidney function in really simple terms. So first, filter everything from the blood that's smaller than a protein. Take back what you want, and this is mainly going to be water, sodium, and some other ions. Also, you want to fine-tune the body's chemistry by selecting how much you want to take back. Do I need to take back more calcium? Do I need to get rid of calcium because I'm making kidney stones? Make sure you secrete what you don't want, like toxins, and then whatever's left over, pass the remainder into the bladder. Spend a little time on that. Think that one through over and over. Filter everything smaller than a protein. Take back what you don't want to lose. Secretion, fine-tuning, and whatever's left over at the end passes into the bladder as urine. With 2 million nephrons, 1 million in each kidney, Clearly you can survive on one million because you can survive with just one kidney. And there's never been any case to believe that donating a kidney shortens one's life. So you have a backup kidney, so to speak. In fact, you probably have twice as much backup as you need because it's been found that premature babies might only have 250,000 nephrons per kidney. So they're operating on 25% and still there doesn't seem to be too many consequences of that. There are technically two types of nephrons, but 85% are in the cortex and they're called cortical nephrons. So the orange guys are cortical nephrons. The other 15% are near or juxta the medulla of the kidney, and so they're called juxtamedullary nephrons. They're specialized in concentrated urine. We'll next step through the major parts of the nephron. First, there's the glomerulus, which is a tuft of capillaries where blood begins to be filtered. When the kidneys filter, they filter everything from the blood that's smaller than a protein. Yeah, I get used to it. I'm going to say that one multiple times. Filter everything smaller than a protein. Water, sodium, and amino acids, and vitamins, and all those things are going to get filtered. To catch the filtrate, the glomerulus is surrounded by something called Bowman's capsule. So we've got the glomerulus. Those are the capillaries bringing in blood to be filtered. They're going to filter everything smaller than a protein into Bowman's capsule. The filtered material is now called filtrates. It won't be urine until it's in the ureters. The proximal convoluted tubule, so it's proximal because it's near the glomerulus and convoluted because it's windy. Since it gets the filtrate first, it has the easiest job of taking back what you want. 
So the proximal convoluted tubule takes back much of the water and sodium, as well as the glucose, amino acids, and vitamins. The loop of is specialized to take back sodium and water. Some of you that are working in healthcare may have heard of loop diuretics. Diuretics cause the body to lose water. Some of the most potent are furosemide or Lasix. Those are loop diuretics. A loop diuretic works in the loop of Henle, and it's generally a really, really potent diuretic requiring significant urination in minutes after taking the drug. I worked in a group home once, and when we would give furosemide, our client would need to use the restroom within 10 minutes. Next is the distal convoluted tubule. Here, the filtrate's fine-tuned so that the body needs to get rid of more sodium or make sure not to lose sodium. That happens in the DCT. Also, the DCT can find things in the blood that were not filtered, and put those back into the filtrate, a procedure called secretion. So in secretion, if something like aspartame misses being filtered and it stays in the blood, the DCT can still grab it from the blood and put it into the filtrate. Kind of cool. The collecting duct will adjust sodium and water concentration to adjust the volume and concentration of urine. So I think about it as the collecting duct takes one last look at water and sodium before the filtrate passes into the ureters and becomes urine. Here's just a nice review slide that goes over each of the parts of the nephron and goes through their major functions. Might be a nice note card. Now we'll start lining up those simple steps in kidney function with parts. So the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule will filter everything smaller than a protein. We take back what we want and all the remaining parts. In the PCT, we take back a lot of water and sodium. We'll also take back glucose, vitamins, amino acids, and other things that the body doesn't want to lose, like bicarbonate as well. The DCT does fine tuning of ions as well as secretion. And finally, the collecting duct takes one last look at sodium and water to adjust the volume and concentration of the urine. So that's the nephron. Blood supply to the nephron. So next we turn to the blood supply. We'll soon see that the amount of blood entering the nephron needs to be controlled or too much or too little will be filtered. Also, there needs to be a blood system that will pick up things that the kidney wants to keep or that you don't want to lose and get that back into the systemic blood supply. This may be a bad metaphor. You've seen this picture already in this and I didn't mention it. But the kidney essentially throws out the baby with the bathwater and then picks up the baby. So it throws everything out, everything smaller than a protein, and then it picks up what it doesn't want to lose. To do this, you have to have two main circulations. First, glomerular capillaries will bring in blood for filtration. That's bringing in the baby with the bathwater. The paratubular capillaries pick up things from the tubules, the things that kidneys want to keep, and return them to the circulation. So that's picking up the baby. I want to return to this point that there's a lot of blood going to the kidneys. It's because it would be hard to calculate iron levels based on how much water or fluid is coming in and how much is being lost. Your body just can't calculate that, that you had so much sodium in this popcorn, you had so much of this water, but the water was not just water, it was Gatorade. So the only choice the body has to make sure that electrolytes are good is to monitor it closely. In that sense, the kidneys are like the helicopter parents of the body, checking the entire blood roughly every four minutes. I might be playing this metaphor out a little bit too much, but the glomerulus brings blood in and filters everything out. That's the baby in the bathwater. Then the paratubular capillaries pick up what you don't want to lose. So just a quick review. We need to look a little closer at the glomeruli capillary beds. So the blood vessel that brings blood into a glomerulus is called the afferent arterial. The vessel carrying blood away from a glomerulus is the efferent arterial. Can you begin to see how controlling the diameter of the afferent and the efferent arterioles will affect how much filtrate is made? So just think about that. How could you change the amount of filtrate by changing the afferent and efferent? We'll get to this soon, but it'd be good to try to see it on your own a little bit. The blood vessels that pick up things the kidneys don't want to lose are the paratubular capillaries. So blood pressure is low here because we want things like water, sodium, vitamins, and amino acids to easily get back into the blood. The way we get the pressure low in the paratubular capillaries is to restrict the size of the efferent arterial. Since blood cannot get through the efferent, there's less pressure in the paratubular capillaries. This also forces pressure up in the glomerulus. This is good because that pressure is necessary to enhance filtration. Maybe recall our case study on congestive heart failure, where we said that when the heart dilates, it gets weak. It's then hard to generate enough pressure to make urine. So in our case study, the patient backed up with fluid, 
This caused distended jugular veins, pitting edema, and fluid in the lungs that made the patient want to sleep sitting up. So we talked back then about how you need to generate a certain amount of pressure to get the kidneys to filter to get rid of fluid. So we do need a certain high pressure in the glomerular capillaries. We'll get to this soon, but while the efferent maintains a low pressure in the paratubular capillaries and a high filtration pressure, the afferent arterial also controls filtration pressure. In fact, the afferent arterial is very important in changing its diameter as systemic blood pressure increases or decreases throughout the day. So your systemic blood pressure is going up when you have an argument, it goes down when you take a nap. The afferent arterial is going to do a lot to make sure that that blood pressure doesn't actually change in your kidneys. If blood pressure goes up, the afferent constricts to prevent too much urine from forming. Or if blood pressure drops, the afferent will dilate to make sure there's still enough pressure to create filtration. So the afferent arterial isolates the glomerulus from fluctuations in the systemic blood flow. It's very important for the afferent arterial to isolate the kidneys from systemic blood pressure because systemic blood pressure changes throughout the day. If the kidneys were not isolated from this, we would make too much urine at times and not enough at other times. So this graph just shows how your blood pressure changes a lot. If you had an argument, all of a sudden you'd make a whole bunch of urine. Or if you were sleeping, you would no longer make any urine at all. So for specific examples, if you went for a run, you'd urinate out all your fluid. And if you're sleeping, your kidneys would stop functioning. This pic is from a YouTube video from several years ago where they took their inebriated friend and put him on a pool float and sent him out into a lake. When you're sleeping, your blood pressure drops. If the afferent arterial did not isolate systemic blood pressure from the kidneys, this low blood pressure would decrease filtration and it would take much longer to sober up because the kidneys would not be excreting the alcohol. The funny or sad thing about this is they all pushed him out into the lake and then thought, well, what if he falls over and falls into the water and doesn't wake up? And all of them are like, I'm not going in after him. Good friends, good friends. This is a fact from Guyton's textbook of medical physiology. If it weren't for the afferent arterial, a 25 millimeter mercury change in blood pressure would increase urination 30 fold. So we'd have to carry on a cath bag or wear a stadium pal. Google that, Google stadium pal. Anyway, that would be a lot of urine, a whole lot of urine every time your blood pressure went up. It gets a lot more complex than just the afferent and the efferent arterials. So we're gonna draw out all the parts on the board or if you want to, you can look it up under glomerular filtration rate on YouTube under Henniger DJ. Before we get to that, let's finish our thoughts on how could the afferent and efferent change to affect how much filtrate is used, a question I asked you a few slides back. For the afferent, if the afferent arterial dilates, more blood is going to be delivered to the glomerulus, and so more filtrate will be formed. If the afferent constricts, less blood will be delivered to the glomerulus, so filtration will be decreased. So a dilated afferent increases filtration, a constricted afferent will decrease filtration. The efferent arterial can also alter filtration. I think of the efferent as being an escape route where fluid can go rather than be filtered. So if the efferent is dilated, there's an easy escape route and fluid will go into the efferent rather than being filtered so filtration will be decreased. If the efferent is constricted, the escape route is cut off, the fluid needs to be filtered, so filtration will go up. So here, dilated efferents will lower filtration, constricted efferents will increase filtration. Dilating the efferent arterial will have what effect on GFR? You're gonna have a bigger escape route, less filtration, GFR will decrease, so I like B. Angiotensin II raises blood pressure by constricting blood vessels. If angiotensin II constricts the efferent arterial more than the afferent arterial, then that effect on GFR would. This is interesting because angiotensin II does constrict blood vessels, and it does constrict the efferent arterial and the afferent arterial. Maybe I should say it this way. It constricts the afferent arterial, so then you wouldn't be filtering as much. But it also constricts the efferent, but slightly more, so even though you have less blood going through the glomeruli, you still get the same amount of filtration. And that's important because then every time angiotensin II was released, you'd stop filtering if the efferent didn't respond more than the afferent. So circle them in your head. Does dilation of the afferent increase filtrate or decrease filtrate? Does constriction of the afferent increase filtrate or decrease filtrate? Does dilation of the efferent increase filtrate or decrease filtrate? 
and this constriction of the efferent increase filtrate or decrease filtrate. So did you get them right? So dilation of the afferent brings more blood to the filtration membrane and increases filtration. Constriction does the opposite and so it decreases filtration. Dilation of the efferent allows fluid to escape the glomerulus rather than be filtered, so filtration is decreased. Constricting the efferent cuts off the escape route and increases filtration. That's blood supply. Next, we're going to start stepping through the parts of the nephron, beginning with the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Clearly, there's a lot that goes on in the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, just looking at this from a bird's eye view. We now start to move into the function of the parts of the nephron. When we think of things anatomically, there are five parts. There's the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, which we'll put together. There's the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. But when we think about the physiology, there are three things happening. Filtration, where we filter everything smaller than the protein. Tubular reabsorption, where we pick up things we don't want to lose. And secretion, where we take things from the blood that were not filtered and put them back into the filtrate. So three processes, five main parts. Maybe this makes a little more sense when we line things up this way. So my conversion from PowerPoint sort of hides that step four. So there should be some weight behind here. So the DCT is the one place where you do secretion. Okay, let's go through that again. Filtration occurs in Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. Reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. And secretion happens. Again, it was supposed to be two colors here. You can kind of see the white behind there, but secretion occurs in the distal convoluted tubule. Here's a simplified figure from Wikipedia. The figure does note that whatever is left over after secretion is excreted. We're going to start on the details of the nephron with the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Note that this part takes up a good portion of our infographic. This is probably the most complex part of the nephron is the filtration part. Filtration surface between the glomerulus and capillaries and Bowman's capsule is about the size of an average whiteboard, so about six square meters, two by three meters. Our first step then is to point out the pressures that drive filtration. Here's a nice schematic of the glomerulus, just a closer view, and the filtration membrane. A first thing to recall is that everything smaller than a protein passes from the blood into the filtrate in Bowman's capsule. This would include everything except platelets, proteins, and blood cells. Glucose, water, amino acids, vitamins, and electrolytes will pass through the filtration membrane and into the filtrate. Which substance would not be expected in urine normally? Enough with the everything smaller than a protein, DJ. I get that it's protein, so it's E. Filter everything smaller than a protein. First, let's review the pressures that controlled the flow of fluid in and out of systemic capillaries because the pressures are similar in the capillaries and the glomerulus. The pressures have different names, but they're the same basic properties. So HPC was the pressure pushing fluid out of the capillary. Since the capillaries and the glomerulus are called glomerular capillaries, HPC now becomes HPG in the glomerulus. So we get HPG, which is essentially blood pressure. Albumin in the blood drew fluid back into the capillaries by osmosis. As a heads up, HPG would be a little larger than HPC was due to the constriction of the efferent. That pressure was called OPC. Here again, replace a C with a G for the glomerulus. So this pressure now is OPG instead of OPC. So OPG would be a little bit bigger than OPC because proteins will be even more concentrated due to filtering everything smaller than a protein from the capillary. So there's going to be more protein left behind, which is going to increase the OPG. A key, 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 key principle with these pressures is that the pressures are small, at least compared to systemic blood pressure. If the pressure gets too high, too much filtrate is going to be made. The amount of filtrate made is referred to as the glomerular filtration rate. If blood pressure is too high, the kidney will create too much filtrate. The kidney will try to take back what it needs, but if there's too much filtrate, it won't be able to get it all back, and so things will be lost to the urine that you want to keep. If the GFR is too low, when the kidney tries to take back the stuff it wants, it will take too much back, including waste products. We'll get to the details of that. So there'll be no filtering. 
So with GFR, we have a pendulum swinging where we don't want GFR too high, so we lose things that we want, and we don't want GFR too low, where we get back things that we don't want. So GFR is a key, key, key thing. On this drawing, there are four mechanisms that control GFR. Actually, a new one has been elucidated since I drew this eight years ago, and I guess we've redrawn it since then. My point is that there's even a newer mechanism within the last 10 years. So we'll add that one. We'll start at the top here with the pressures, and we're going to draw this on the board in class. The key again is that the pressures are small, about 10 millimeters of mercury, when the systemic circuit can vary by 100 millimeters of mercury. So the pressures in here vary by a small amount, while your systemic blood pressure can vary by quite a bit. This figure uses a little bit of a simplification in the naming. So what it says here is blood hydrostatic pressure is HPG. So HPG is the blood hydrostatic pressure. This is the blood pressure in the glomerular capillaries. As I mentioned before, it's higher than in the systemic capillaries because the constriction of the efferent arteria. So remember, it was around 30, 35 in capillaries. Now it's 55. And that 55 might vary a little bit now and again. Blood colloid osmotic pressure is our OPG. And it's caused by the protein in the capillaries drawing fluid back into the capillaries by osmosis. It's about 30 millimeters of mercury, slightly higher than the 25 millimeters of mercury we had in systemic capillaries. There's another pressure here due to the confined space. So there's a confined space here in the capsule. And it's called HPC. Unfortunately, HPC, like it was HPC for the capillary before. Now the C stands for capsule. So fluid in Bowman's capsule pushes back against more fluid trying to come over. This pressure is about 15 millimeters of mercury. Note that HPG is pushing fluid out of the glomerular capillaries while OPG and HPC are trying to get fluid back into the capillaries. So these are opposing forces. When we add up the pressures, we get the net filtration pressure. Since HPG is the biggest pressure, the net filtration pressure favors filtering fluid from the glomerular capillaries to the glomerulus with a pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury. Depending on your text source, the net filtration pressure is between 7 and 10 millimeters of mercury. This is a small pressure difference again, given that the systemic circulation can vary from 100 over 60 when sleeping to 180 over 120 when someone is exercising. We've seen this figure before, and the only point is to show that blood pressure can vary by a lot throughout the day. If the glomerulus wasn't isolated from these changes, the GFR would vary a lot throughout the day. Maybe it'd be good because every time you'd have an argument, you'd have to go to the bathroom. Or maybe we just argue in the bathroom a whole lot. So the point being, the kidneys can increase and decrease filtration rate based on blood pressure because then GFR would go up too high, you'd lose things that you want to keep. Or GFR would go too low, and you'd keep things that you don't want to keep. Have I mentioned that GFR is a key, key, key thing? Again, an AMP2 redundancy is good. Let's add a bit here, though. When substances are filtered in the tubules, the tubules will try to pump those things back into the blood. But those transporters don't really speed up or slow down. They just keep picking things up. If things go by too fast, they can't pick everything up that they should keep. And so not all the good things are picked up. Also, the tubules are a little bit leaky, so waste products can leak out of the tubes and get back into the blood. So again here, if GFR is too low, waste products that should stay in the filtrate leak out and make it back into the blood. So to summarize, if GFR is too high, needed substances cannot be reabsorbed quickly enough and they're lost in the urine. You would dehydrate and lose important substances like glucose and vitamins. If the GFR is too low, everything is reabsorbed, including wastes that are normally disposed of and you would not get rid of those wastes. The grocery store metaphor at the bottom is if you go through the grocery store too fast, you forget the things that you want, you don't pick up everything you need, like you forget the bread or you forget the milk. If you go through the grocery store too slow, everything starts looking good, and the next thing you know, you're buying ding-dongs and ho-hos and twinkies and things like that. So you can't have too high of a GFR, you can't have too low of a GFR. That wraps up a small part of the drawing, so the part that says why GFR is important. We'll now go through the mechanisms to isolate glomerular capillaries from systemic blood pressure. So we've talked about the pressures, and we've talked a little bit about why. Hopefully you've seen, well, if the blood pressure difference in the glomerulus is only 10 millimeters of mercury, and systemic blood pressure is changing by a lot more than that, we got to have a lot of mechanisms that isolate the glomerulus from systemic blood pressure. And there are a lot of mechanisms that are really important to maintain GFR, 
We have a lot of mechanisms to make sure that happens. Some people break the methods of controlling GFR into intrinsic controls, extrinsic controls, and hormonal controls. Intrinsic controls are things that happen in the kidney. Extrinsic controls are things like the autonomic nervous system that controls blood pressure. And hormonal controls are substances released by the kidneys that act as hormones, namely renin. I don't know that this classification of neuronal controls and intrinsic really helps because there's five mechanisms it might just be easier to memorize the five mechanisms regardless of whether they are intrinsic, extrinsic, or hormonal. I think that's a little bit over categorization to say that this mechanism is intrinsic. Just know the five main mechanisms. Here's a graphic of the divisions. So these are intrinsic, extrinsic, and hormonal. But again, I might just break them up into you've got autoregulation, you've got the JG cells, you've got the MD cells, you've got the sympathetic nervous system, and then you have cells called Lysangio cells. And that's how we draw it out when we draw it out. First, we'll do autoregulation of the arterioles. This autoregulation occurs by myogenic control. Does that ring a bell? We talked about autoregulation when we talked about blood vessels. So autoregulation is when a blood vessel can change its own diameter to control flow. At that time, when we talked about it before, we said there are two types of autoregulation. Metabolic was when the precapillary sphincters open and close based on the local needs of the local tissue. Myogenic control was when a blood vessel was more concerned with flow and so the diameter changed to keep flow constant, whereas most blood vessels try to maintain blood pressure. Maintaining a constant flow is important in the brain and the kidneys because too little or too much blood can really mess things up. Too much blood in the brain will cause swelling. Myogenic control might be a little counterintuitive because we know maintaining pressure is so important. Here again, we need to think about flow. If a blood vessel experiences a decrease in pressure and we want to keep flow the same, the blood vessel has to dilate. Or if a vessel has increased pressure, we don't want too much blood to flow to that area, so the vessel needs to constrict. This figures from Arthur C. Guyton again, Textbook of Medical Physiology, which is just an excellent book for, for anyone who likes physiology and wants it explained with great detail, but in a way that's approachable and understandable. This figure shows that as systemic blood pressure increases, so as blood pressure goes up, renal blood pressure and GFR plateaus. So across 50 to 180 millimeters of mercury, renal blood flow and glomerular filtration plateau. That means that for a wide range of arterial blood pressures, GFR and renal blood flow doesn't change a lot. While there's an increase in urine production, as you would want to get the pressure back down, the curve on the bottom would be a whole lot steeper if GFR was not held relatively stable. Next up is a mechanism created by juxta glomerular cells, which we will call JG cells. Juxta means near the glomerulus. So I'll mention this at the end, but begin to appreciate that since the NFP in the glomerulus is so small, while systemic blood pressure varies by eight times that, there needs to be many mechanisms to control GFR. The body does not want to screw this up, so it has several mechanisms. On this figure, find the afferent arterial, which is down here. And note the purple cells surrounding it, so these little purple or magenta cells surrounding it. There should be some in this figure, there should be some of these cells also on the efferent. There are some JG cells usually around the efferent as well. JG cells are mechanoreceptors that sense stretch. If stretch is too low, it means blood flow into the glomerulus is too low and GFR will be too low. In this case, the JG cells will release renin. Renin goes through a long cascade, which we'll get to shortly. But at this point, let's just think of renin as increasing salt absorption and causing systemic vasoconstriction, so all blood vessels will constrict. Also note the time scale. Causing systemic vasoconstriction will cause a relatively quick increase in blood pressure. Absorbing more sodium from the kidneys will increase water absorption as well. The sodium may also stimulate thirst. With more sodium and water, there's gonna be more blood and blood pressure will come up. If, on the other hand, if stretch is too high in the JG cells, it means blood flow into the glomerulus is too high and GFR will be too high. In this case, the JG cells will reduce the release of renin. Reduced renin will cause loss of sodium by the kidneys and vasodilation. So when sodium is lost, there will be less water absorbed, which means there will be less blood, and that will cause a drop in blood pressure. So JG cells can control blood pressure by releasing renin to cause systemic vasodilation 
or vasoconstriction or increase or decrease sodium and water levels. Our next mechanism is provided by the macula densa cells. Here, note that the DCT comes back. So this DCT right here was also connected to this PCT over here. So the DCT comes back between the afferent and efferent arterioles of the glomerulus that it's connected to. So the fluid in the proximal convoluted tubule at the right will end up in the distal convoluted tubule that's on the left and is between the afferents and the efferent arterioles. The macula densa cells line the walls of the DCT between the arterioles. So these are the green guys. This also puts the MD cells near the JG cells. In fact, some people refer to this entire area as the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and it includes the JG MD cells. Macula densa cells are osmoreceptors or chemoreceptors. What they sense is sodium. This is a beautiful signal. Take the time to get this. Remember that the transporters in the tubules are not perfect. They work at one speed. So if GFR is too low, the transporters will keep picking up sodium. They'll just keep picking up things, and they'll pick up too much. So then there'll be too little sodium at the MD cells, and they will sense the low GFR. So low sodium at the MD cells means low GFR. Then the MD cells will dilate the afferent arterial to get up the flow, to increase the flow, and it will stimulate the JG cells to release more renin. Do you remember what renin will do? If not, go back and look. So if the GFR is too high, the transporters don't have enough time to pick up the sodium. So there'll be too much sodium with the MD cells. So if the MD cells sense high sodium, this means GFR is too high. So the MD cells will constrict the afferent arterial to decrease filtration and will inhibit the JG cells to decrease renin release. Pretty cool. To review then, if blood pressure decreases, that's going to be sensed by the JG cells, which release renin, and then renin is going to increase blood pressure. If blood pressure increases, that's going to be less filtration. Everything went too fast through the kidneys, and that's going to result in excess salt on the urine. Excess salt, I guess that should say filtrate. Excess salt is picked up by the macula densa cells, and that will decrease or inhibit renin. And then inhibition of renin will decrease blood pressure. Take your time to get JG and MD cells. Which of the following statements about JG cells is incorrect? They are mechanoreceptors. They do regulate blood pressure. They do release renin. I hope D is right. They respond to changes in the sodium concentration. No, they don't change in response to sodium concentration. They respond to stretch. MD cells respond to sodium concentration. The neural controls that regulate GFR are primarily due to the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system causes slow, gradual changes in blood pressure, as in long-term stressful times, like thinking about an AMP2 test that's coming up. And I don't know if I've mentioned it, but the urinary system is the toughest system in AMP2, so this is kind of a big stressful test. So when you start thinking about this test, as I keep talking about this test, and for the next few days as you start thinking about this test, and we get closer to this test, this big test, this toughest test in AMP2, your blood pressure is going to increase and increase and increase slightly, but slowly over time because of the pressure of this test. Kind of kidding, but not really. How it's going to do that is through the sympathetic nervous system. So at rest, renal blood vessels are maximally dilated, allowing a maximum flow. And so autoregulation mechanisms prevail. So it can decrease its diameter, but it's not really going to increase its diameter. But when under stress, as when thinking about this test, norepinephrine or noradrenaline is released by the sympathetic nervous system, and epinephrine is released by the adrenal medulla. These hormones cause afferent arterioles to constrict, reducing filtration. You won't go to the bathroom as much. So if there's less urine formed, fluid will build up, blood pressure will increase. Also, the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the renin angiotensin mechanism on its own, causing, well, you know. And if you don't, please go back and review. If you stimulate renin, what's going to happen? Increased sodium absorption, systemic vasoconstriction. So here's where I don't like dividing things up this way because we've already talked about renin as being part of the renal autoregulation and extrinsic controls. But let's play along just so we can get the details of the renin system. This system is also called the RAS system or the renin angiotensin system. Here's the sequence listed out, but for the narration, I'll talk over the picture that's coming up next. The underlying reasoning I like to think of is that renin is the kidney's way of saying it wants to raise blood pressure. But 
What if other systems that are affected by blood pressure don't want to raise blood pressure? They're like, I can't deal with this increased blood pressure right now. So recall that the liver and those heptads need just the right amount of fluid flow. So hepatocytes can filter, store vitamins, detoxify, and all the other things the liver does. So we talked about when we looked at slides of the liver, how the fluid has to kind of flow through there at just the right rate and how hepatitis, where there's too much fluid, can mess with that. So the liver can't deal with too much food or increased blood pressure at certain times. Similarly, the capillaries and the lungs are delicate, so they can't deal with an increase in blood pressure unless they're healthy. Maybe the adrenal gland is already releasing hormones to raise blood pressure and doesn't need the kidney interfering or messing with it. So this whole cascade allows the kidney to try and raise blood pressure as long as other systems don't veto it because they're not ready to deal with the high blood pressure. So the specifics are that renin from the kidneys combines with angiotensinogen from the liver to make angiotensin 1. If the cells in the body are not healthy, they don't make everything they need. It's kind of the same with the rest of us. If you're happy and healthy, you get all the way through your to-do list. If you're sick, you only get through the top things on your to-do list. So if the liver is too overwhelmed by fluid to do what it does, it's not going to be able to make angiotensinogen. If it can't make angiotensinogen, then the renin cascade is vetoed and you don't make angiotensin 1. If the liver is happy, then the angiotensin 1 will be made and it floats through the blood and it floats through the lungs and encounters angiotensin converting enzyme. If capillaries of the lungs, which are the most delicate capillaries in the body, are happy, then they'll make ACE. If they're not happy, they won't make ACE. If ACE is made, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 automatically provides widespread vasoconstriction without even going any further. But angiotensin 2 on its own will start to increase blood pressure by causing systemic vasoconstriction. From there, angiotensin 2 will pass through the adrenal cortex and gets converted into aldosterone. Let's say if the adrenal cortex is already making norepinephrine, it can't convert as much aldosterone. It's doing something else. So if the adrenal cortex is already raising blood pressure, it vetoes the renin cascade here and proceeds on with its own mechanism to make adrenaline. So aldosterone, if it is made, will cause the collecting duct of the nephron, so it's going to go down to the collecting duct, to take in more sodium at the direction of aldosterone. So the RAS ultimately vasoconstricts and increases sodium levels, which will stimulate thirst to increase fluid levels. But all along the pathway, if somebody's not happy, it gets vetoed. I always think about an ACE inhibitor called lisinopril. What lisinopril is, is it's actually, it's a snail toxin, I think is what it is. But I took lisinopril for a while, and it created this incredible cough in me. That's one of the side effects of lisinopril. My pet theory, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it inhibited some enzyme in my lung that helped clear my lungs of mucus and protein and things like that. And so what happened is this protein and stuff debris built up that made my cells unhappy in my lungs and they couldn't make ACE. So I got off lisinopril. So it made this horrible cough, probably by making my lungs unhealthy. And then when they were unhealthy, they no longer made ACE. And so lisinopril was an ACE inhibitor. I don't know how true that is, but that was my particular, seemed like my particular mechanism. It was a horrible cough. It was a cough every five minutes, multiple, multiple times a day for weeks. Renin, it really is a pretty cool way to let the kidneys raise blood pressure, but let other structures veto the increase. A little bit of a review here. We've covered three of these steps already. So renin is released when they sense decreased stretch in the JG cells, when MD cells sense too low sodium, and so GFR is low, and then they stimulate the JG cells. The sympathetic nervous system can stimulate JG cells to release renin, also, angiotensin 2, this one's kind of interesting, also stimulates renin release. So if the liver and lungs and everybody's happy, there's a positive feedback. Like, not only did we not get vetoed, but everybody said it's okay, so let's run with this and stimulate this fur further. So angiotensin 2 actually stimulates further renin release. The most important factor affecting glomerular filtration rate is probably HPG which would be E in this case. That's the biggest pressure. Nephron cells that respond to the concentration of filtrate, that would be the JG, uh, just kidding, macula densa cells. Hopefully you're like, oh, what? No. As complex and as controlled as GFR seems to be, there's still other factors that might play a role. 
So another interesting one is that the cells around the filtration membrane, this is the fifth one that I'm adding in that was discovered recently, cells around the filtration membrane are called mesangial cells. And they seem to open up and close the pores in the filtration membrane to help control GFR. So ultimately, GFR is one of the most controlled things in the body. There's five strong controllers of GFR, and there may be more to come. The five are myogenic control, JG cells, MD cells, the sympathetic nervous system, and then these mesangial cells seem to open and close to also alter GFR. Could be others like nitric oxide, adenosine, and endothelin. Giving a patient an angiotensin II inhibitor should have what effect on urine production? So you're going to inhibit angiotensin II. Angiotensin II would normally increase sodium absorption, so now we're going to decrease sodium absorption. I like D. All right, that's it for glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. On to PCT. Not quite as dense if we compare, but still a lot going on in PCT. We now turn to tubular reabsorption, which will occur in the PCT, loop of Henle, DCT, and collecting duct. So tubular absorption is represented by two here. Two here, and two here. After filtering everything smaller than a protein, we now need to get back what we don't want to lose. That take back is tubular reabsorption. Here's one of the reasons why the urinary system is such a tough system. What we have covered so far seems pretty complex. We drew out this whole big GFR, and it's going to seem complex at least until it settles into your brain and you start to think, well, that's not so bad. But we've only covered the first part of the nephron. We now have to turn to tubular absorption, which will occur in the PCT, loop of Henle, DCT, and then we'll come back to the collecting duct. So what we've covered seems pretty complex, but we're only part of the way there still. The kidneys filter the entire blood volume 60 times a day. How much blood do you have? Five to six liters. So that's somewhere 300 to 360 liters of blood filtered a day. And about 120 to 180 of that is actually converted into filtrate. we got to get a lot of that back. You can't urinate out 180 liters. Clearly, you don't even have that much, so you can't do that. So clearly, we have to get a lot of that back. Plus, we don't want to lose any of the glucose or vitamins. It's not so important in the human diet because there's probably plenty of glucose and vitamins in a typical diet. Maybe not vitamins, but definitely glucose. But we also have to think about animals in this case. Deer in Iowa in the middle of winter are searching hard for a glucose source. And so they cannot be urinating out glucose. So maybe humans could do it, but animals should not be urinating out glucose because it's hard to get glucose. If we look at the percentages of the important things that we want to get back, note how good our kidneys are at getting back water and sodium. We get back 99.4%. Now you have to lose some of that because we're ingesting water and we're ingesting sodium. So that's what we're getting rid of. We lose some potassium, and we've talked about that briefly. Essentially, because the sodium-potassium transporter is used to get sodium back, some potassium has to go in the opposite direction. So we get only 93.3% of the potassium back. Our kidneys can be perfect. We can get all the bicarbonate back and all the glucose back. Unfortunately, because of leakage, some of the urea can come back too. So urea is a waste product. And this emphasizes why GFR can't get too low. If it gets too low, urea has time to get back into the blood. Inulin is a substance that can be injected. It's kind of a polysaccharide that's not really toxic, but it's kind of a natural sugar that we can't digest. There should be no reabsorption of inulin. Your kidneys can get rid of it 100%. So again, your kidneys are capable of being quite perfect. As we go through the nephron, recall what each part was concentrated on, the PCT gets back the easy stuff like water, glucose, and a lot of sodium. The loop of Henle focuses on water and sodium. The DCT fine tunes, and it also does this thing called secretion. And the collecting duct takes one last look at water and sodium to adjust urine volume and concentration. We'll start with the PCT. Redundancy is good. The PCT takes back the easy stuff, sodium, water, and glucose. When talking about tubular reabsorption, there's two paths. So what we have here is the paratubular capillary. We have the wall of the tubule, and this yellow is the filtrate. There are two paths. The paracellular pathway goes around the cells that make the tubule. The transcellular pathway goes across the membranes of the cells that make up the tubules and the paratubular capillaries. 
the key thing about the parasitoid pathway is that it's small, and so not much can follow this path. But if something can follow this path, there's nothing to stop it. So small ions are free to follow the parasitoid pathway if there's a concentration gradient to drive this movement. So the tubules set up a concentration gradient to pull ions out of the filtrate and get them back into the blood. And it's generated by this sodium, I guess it's not this pump, but a sodium pump like this, a sodium potassium pump. Since the paracellular pathway only allows small ions, everything else has to go across the cells that make up the tubules or follow the transcellular pathway. A good thing is that if there's something in the filtrate that should stay in the filtrate, that substance would have to pass through the luminal wall, the basal lateral wall, and then also the wall of the paratubular capillary. So some substances that are lipid soluble can make it through if GFR is too low. So if the GFR is going through here slowly, those substances have time to leak over. If, on the other hand, the body wants something out of the filtrate and back into the blood, like glucose, amino acids, and vitamins, they're transporters to facilitate the transcellular pathway to get things back into the blood. Much of the force that drives substances out of the filtrate in the tubule and towards the paratubular blood comes from a diffusion gradient. This diffusion gradient is created by the active pumping of sodium. I hit this point multiple times, but if you pump sodium out of the tubule, water will follow it. When water leaves, substances in the filtrate are now more concentrated. Since they're more concentrated, a gradient's been created that drives things out of the tubule and towards the paratubular capillary. So essentially, once sodium moves, water and other substances will follow it. So let's look at it now with this figure. Sodium potassium pumps in the basolateral outer membrane of the tubule will pump sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. So we're pumping sodium this way and potassium this way. When sodium is pumped out, it will pull the sodium out of the cell. Because sodium is lower in the cell, it's going to pull sodium out of the filtrate too. So it's going to pull it from way over here and it'll pull the sodium across. Next thing that will happen is water will follow that sodium. And when sodium and water leave, what is left behind will become more concentrated. So we pump sodium, that's going to push sodium into the blood and it's going to pull sodium out of the filtrate. When we move sodium, we move water. When we move water, we concentrate whatever's left behind. Now those things will follow the sodium and the water because now they have a concentration gradient. Let's look at this comic book style. I know it's not really comic book style, but in the top left, there are many things in the filtrate. So we've got sodium over here, we've got water, we've got other things like glucose and vitamins. We pump sodium over. When we pump sodium over, water's going to follow. If I was good at art, I would have made this shrink because when water moves from here to here, everything over here becomes more concentrated. When everything over here becomes more concentrated, then those things follow their concentration gradients and move from the filtrate over into the blood. Again, some potassium has to stay behind. The potassium stays behind because the sodium was transported this way while the potassium was transported the other way. So things like amino acids and glucose will follow a concentration gradient and get back into the blood. So this reviews those two points. So sodium drives reuptake. When we push sodium over, water follows it and everything else. So that means that sodium levels are going to drive reuptake kind of like GFR did. Also, potassium has to be lost because it's pumped towards the filtrate to get the sodium to move towards the paratubular blood. So do you see then how sodium will affect reabsorption? Like I said, it ends up being a bit like GFR in the first place. So do you see how if the sodium drives reuptake, if the sodium in the blood gets really, really high, so if there's already a lot of sodium in the blood, it's going to be hard to pump more over because pumps can only pump so much. If you can't pump sodium over, then water won't follow it and those other things won't follow. So high sodium will reduce reuptake. This ends up being a bit like high GFR where you're going to lose things that you want to keep. So if you can't pump sodium over because there's a lot of sodium over there, then water won't follow and other things won't follow. And if other things won't follow, it means they're stuck over here in the filtrate and they're going to be lost to the urine. Just like high GFR causes things to be lost to the urine. If sodium is low, then the pump can pump a lot of sodium over, which means lots of water will follow. And so this will increase the gradient that pulls everything from the filtrate over into the blood. 
So this will help things we want, like glucose, vitamins, and amino acids, but it also will help things we don't like, like urea. So low sodium is kind of like having a low GFR where things don't get filtered. They, everything makes it back into the blood. Things that are transported have a transport maximum because these transporters can't transport at any speed. They have a limit. They basically operate at one speed. So if things like glucose are really concentrated in the filtrate, not all of it will get transported. The point of this slide then is just to hit that point that the transporters in the tube will work at one main speed. Transport maximums always remind me of the episode of I Love Lucy called Lucy and the Chocolate Factory. You can Google it. If the things, it's copyright protected, so that's why I can't put it in here. But if the things moving by the PCT are moving too fast or any of the tubules, they get lost at the end of the conveyor belt. So in this video, the speed of the chocolate going by is too fast and they can't package the chocolate fast enough. So they ended up like eating the chocolate and stuffing it down their shirt. It's kind of funny. Anyway, so things are lost off the end of the conveyor belt. In the kidney, when everything can't get picked up, it's excreted. So in the skit, the conveyor belt moves too fast for them to pick things up, or there's just too much on the conveyor belt too. Either way, things are lost off the end. So the same is true for the kidneys. When there's either too much in the filtrate or GFR is too high, things don't get picked up, lost off the end of the conveyor, which means things are lost into the urine. They're excreted into the urine. So then things remain in the filtrate and are not reabsorbed when they lack carriers. They're not lipid soluble or they're too large to pass around the cells in the parasitic pathway. We could also add things that are not reabsorbed if GFR is too high or if there's something in it that's too high of a concentration so that the transport maximum is reached. For the most part, things that are not reabsorbed are things like urea, creatinine, and uric acid, which are waste products, so that's good. Continuing the review, with water-soluble and desired substances, small lines will go around the cells and follow the parasitic pathway. Large molecules will have transporters. With lipid-soluble substances, they might pass transcellularly, but at least there are three membranes to cross, so if GFR is high enough, the ability of the waste products to leak back will be limited. If we look at what is reabsorbed, in a general sense, a lot of the sodium is picked back up. All nutrients like glucose and amino acids are picked back up. Most ions and water are picked up and lost only to offset what was consumed in the diet. Some urea and lipid soluble waste products are picked up and any amino acid or small protein that is filtered will also get picked back up. How is sodium reabsorbed? Active transport. On a side note, just to throw this one in, so the answer to this was A is I often will point this out to nutrition students that if you eat too much sugar, you're going to get diabetes. If you eat too much fat, you're going to get heart disease. If you eat too much protein, you're going to cause kidney failure. So if you eat a lot of protein, when the kidneys pick up the small protein that might be filtered, this acts a bit like the sodium being picked up. So small proteins can be filtered, but then in the PCT, there's transporters to pick those back up. So a high protein diet is a bit like having a low GFR, and a low protein diet is like having a high GFR. So if you've got a lot of protein in your diet, one, it's gonna plug the holes in the filtration membrane. Two, some of it's gonna get filtered, and in the effort to pick that protein back up, you're gonna pick up a lot of other things that you don't want, like a low GFR. So high protein diets are bad for the kidneys because it clogs up the filtration membrane and it causes waste products to be picked back up. So our big ideas in this class, one of the big ideas is to link anatomy to physiology to clinical care. So in a clinical setting, patients with kidney failure will often have a low protein diet. Which substance below would probably have the lowest reabsorption? We would hope it would be urea. You want all the other things. Oh, we already did that one. We said it would be. Lupifenly. Loop of Henle is specialized for taking up sodium. So recall that the loop of Henle is specialized to extract even more water and sodium from the filtrate. Also from this figure, notice some pretty simple anatomy. The part of the loop of Henle that dives down deeper into the cortex is called the descending loop. The part that ascends towards the cortex and the DCT is the ascending loop. So note those terms because we're going to use those terms. The ultimate goal of the loop of Henle is to absorb sodium and water. Other ions are absorbed too, so the loop uses something called countercurrent multiplication. I would encourage you to try to understand this process. As an example of taking something complex, 
that basically confused us for a long time and then it turned out to be pretty simple. So one of our mastery or big idea skills is to simplify the complex. This mechanism was not worked out until the 40s or 50s. Understanding how the kidney concentrated urine was too complex to comprehend until the mechanism was found to be based on two simple rules. So it's a nice example of, man, it looks so complex, it looks so complex, but it's actually pretty simple. So first, let's point out what the countercurrent exchanger does. The countercurrent exchanger creates a gradient, shown here with these ion numbers, a concentration gradient of a salt and urea. So the deeper into the kidney, so if we took this and we said this is a loop of Henle, and these loops of Henle are diving deeper into the kidney. So we take these numbers and put it onto the kidney. Then as you go deeper into the kidney, the concentration of ions like sodium and urea increase. So at the cortex, the concentration is 300 milliosmol, while deep in the kidneys, the concentration is 1250 milliosmol. The purpose of this concentration gradient is that as filtrate, go back over here, is as filtrate goes down through the loop of Henle, water in the filtrate is going to be attracted to this concentration gradient because water moves towards concentration. So it's a way to pull the water out of the filtrate. So as it does this, water exits the tubule following the concentration gradient, so water is extracted from the filtrate. To create the concentration gradient, there are two simple rules, as I said earlier. The descending limb is only permeable to water and is not permeable to solutes. So water can leave, urea can enter, but sodium and chloride can't pass. The ascending limb is permeable to solutes, but not to water. So it's going to pump sodium and chloride out, but water cannot enter. So in fact, the ascending limb has sodium pumps that can pump until they have created a 200 milliosmol difference between the solution in the filtrate or in the tubule and out of the tubule. That 200 milliosmol is going to be kind of a key. Again, kind of like panel style. So like with sodium driving things out of the PCT, this is pretty complex and we're going to break it down into simple steps. So we'll draw things out kind of like comic book style. Not really, I know. So first we'll start here in A, shows the tube, tubule with isotonic fluid. So the concentration everywhere is the same. Now let's look at the ascending limb. The ascending limb will pump until there's a 200 milliosmol difference between the inside and outside of the tube. So we got 200 here and 400 here. So it's pumping sodium chloride out of the filtrate. So that's why this concentration is going down and into the interstitial space or the space around the tubule. So this concentration goes up. So sodium is pumped out of the ascending loop, raising the osmotic pressure outside and lowering it inside. And again, note that the maximum gradient is 200 milliosmol. Once we're in this situation, notice that we don't like this concentration gradient, so we want water to flow to balance this concentration gradient. Water cannot leave the ascending limb, but it can leave the descending limb. So now we have a concentration difference where there's a higher concentration outside of the tubule than inside the tubule. Water will try to move towards concentration. Water cannot leave the ascending tubule as this tubule is not permeable to water. Water can leave the descending tubule so the concentration equilibrates between the descending tubule and the area outside of the tube. This means that the concentration in the descending limb has gone up since water has left. So the concentration has gone up since water has left. As fluid continues to move through the tubule, so this fluid is continuing through this tubule, the concentration difference across the ascending limb equilibrates again. This means that the transporters can pump again. So now they can pump up to their 200 milliosmol difference again. In the second round then, the sodium pump produces another 200 milliosmol difference across the membrane. But it's starting to form a concentrated solution. So you start to see that we're getting a concentration difference. And if we keep going, I won't keep walking us through the sequence multiple times, but you can see how a concentration gradient is developing simply by pumping sodium chloride out of the ascending limb and letting water balance that concentrated sodium chloride by water leaving the descending limb. So we can now start to see, like I said, how that gradient begins. The slide just lists all the steps in case you want to print off a screen capture or pause here and read through it again. Ultimately, the consequence of the loop of Henle and the countercurrent exchanger is that 80% of the water 
and 85% of the sodium is reabsorbed out of the filtrate. Plus, a gradient is built up, and that gradient will be important later on because it's also going to help to pull fluid out of the filtrate in the collecting duct and DCT. Death of mitochondria in the sending limb of the loop of Henle would result in, well, you're not going to have ATP, you're not going to be able to run transporters, not going to be able to pump sodium chloride out of the ascending limb. So that means sodium and chloride are going to build up in the filtrate. So I like a tough question, kind of. DCT, hey, look at that. It gets a lot easier now. Next is DCT. We call it DCT fine tunes and also does secretion. So an important thing to know is that once you get past the loop of Henle, the tubules are not as leaky. They're thicker. So now when you move something into or out of the tubule, it's more likely to stay there compared to the PCT and loop. This means that this is a good time to fine tune because that fine tuning won't be reversed by leakage. Also, now's a good time to do secretion because if something is taken out of the blood and put into the tubule or into the filtrate, it can't leak back out now. So that's why filtration and fine tuning happens in the DCT. Let's do secretion. Everything smaller than a protein should be filtered. So everything smaller than a protein should come out of the blood and into the filtrate. But that's kind of hard to make that 100% because some molecules might miss the filtration and stay in the blood. So secretion can grab something. Maybe there's an aspartate or a sodium benzoate that stayed here. It's going to travel into the paratubular blood. Secretion can grab molecules that are still in the blood and put it back into the filtrate. We know this because when we inject a natural substance that's not normally found in the body, inulin, it all comes out of the kidney in one pass. So there's no inulin in the renal vein in a healthy kidney. It's able to get all of it either secreted or filtered so that none of it will be in the blood leaving the kidney. Other things that are done with secretion is controlling pH, getting rid of excess potassium, or getting rid of things like uric acid. The DCT also fine tunes a good deal of ions like calcium, sodium, protons, potassium, water, bicarbonate, and chloride. I think about it as somewhere in the body has to make sure that there's the correct balance of things like potassium, sodium, and the like. That places the DCT. So you want to have enough calcium so your bones are strong, not too strong, not too much calcium, sorry, so that you start making bone where you don't want to make bone. So somebody's got to fine tune calcium, and it's the DCT that does this. Collecting duct, the two things a collecting duct does, it takes one last look at water and sodium to adjust concentration and volume of the urine. Water reabsorption is under the control of ADH or antidiuretic hormone. We studied that when we covered the endocrine system. It's released by the posterior pituitary. What's the other hormone released by the posterior pituitary? Can you remember? Can you remember the other hormones released by the pituitary, the anterior? It's scary how fast we forget those facts. And that's why you should attend to your mastery skills. You're going to forget facts, but you're not going to forget skills. So control of salt is under the control of aldosterone. This is the molecule that is made at the end of the renin cascade. So you might want to remember ADH from the posterior pituitary. The other hormone from the posterior pituitary is oxytocin. I'll let you go back and look up the hormones of the anterior pituitary. There's a lot of them there, and I don't want to get distracted. This is a snapshot from the infographic that just summarizes how the two hormones can interact in the collecting duct. So if you need more fluid because BP is low, so if you need to increase blood pressure, then both ADH and aldosterone will work. ADH will take up water, aldosterone will take up salts. If the blood is too concentrated, then ADH will work alone to take up just water. If the blood is too dilute, then aldosterone alone can increase sodium. I think that little snapshot of the infographic is probably enough. If you want just water, you have ADH. If you want just salt, you have aldosterone. If you want both salt and water, you have ADH and aldosterone. But I feel like uh, I need to. I need some slides here. So ADH is released by the posterior pituitary when blood concentrations have too much sodium. This will make the collecting duct take up more water. Do you know what condition is related to decreased ADH? So it's diabetes insipidus, diabetes insipidus. When we hear diabetes, we often think of mellitus, that's the sugar one, but diabetes simply means frequent urination. Do you see how a lack of ADH would lead to diabetes? 
ADH is also known as vasopressin. This is because when ADH levels get high, it will increase blood vessel constriction. So it'll press on the veins or press on vessels, I guess is the better way. An interesting thing to note for those of age is that alcohol is a pretty good inhibitor of ADH. So when we drink, we lose water and our urine is diluted. So dehydration leads to a lot of the symptoms of hangover because alcohol is inhibiting ADH and we lose a lot of water in our urine. One theory I've heard, it's anecdotal, is that dehydration drains a bit of the CSF, the fluid around the brain. The brain sinks a bit, which is normally floating, and pulls on the meninges. So if you're going to drink, make sure you hydrate. Okay, so ADH tells the kidneys in the collecting duct to take up more water. It's inhibited by alcohol. That ADH is produced by the posterior pituitary. When we talk about aldosterone, we'll mainly talk about increases in sodium absorption. It can be important to note that aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump. So while aldosterone is mainly used to bring up sodium concentrations, it's also released when potassium levels are too high. So too high of potassium can also stimulate aldosterone. You can see then that there's always a trade-off of sodium and potassium. If you're trying to keep one, you're losing the other. If you're trying to lose one, you're keeping the other. So high potassium will lead to high sodium once the high potassium stimulates aldosterone. Chloride is also prone to follow the sodium, so chloride is also affected by aldosterone. So increased potassium levels or decreased sodium levels will stimulate aldosterone. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase which means you're gonna pull more sodium out of the filtrate, but you're gonna lose more potassium into the filtrate. And that hopefully will normalize sodium and potassium levels. Diuretics, this is one of those areas, if you're going to nursing, it might be a good time to spend some extra time on diuretics to make your life easier for when you get into the program. We'll just talk about main types. Osmotic diuretics take fluid with them. So for example, glucose will carry water with it. Mannitol can be given. Mannitol is a sugar that's not really digested and as it passes into the urine, it will take water along with it. So it's kind of a weak osmotic. Drugs that inhibit the sodium transporter in the loop of Henle, like Lasix or furosemide, will be really potent loop diuretics. Alcohol, which inhibits ADH, is a diuretic. Caffeine inhibits um, sodium absorption, that's to say sodium absorption, which is also a diuretic. Here's some more examples if you want to read through them quick. My purpose in putting them here is just so you see how complex things get. In fact, you can get to a point where it's so potent of a diuretic that you lose potassium. So then you have to come back with what are called potassium sparing diuretics. Diuretics are kind of complex. So if you want to see the complexity even more, just go to Wikipedia page on diuretics. Just as when I suggested looking up hematocrit, Diuretics will begin to reveal some of the complexity you're going to see in allied health. Though it's still pretty understandable, it's understandable. So look it up, it's not all that complex, but it does show some of the complexity you're going to see when you get into your program courses, especially if you went into nursing. When it gets more complex, you realize that diuretics can cause electrolyte imbalances. So the key thing about this one is it shows adverse effects and symptoms. So if you get rid of too much fluid, you'll also wash out potassium. So loop diuretics will cause the loss of potassium, which means, which means there are other diuretics being repetitive here. And those are called potassium sparing diuretics. So then as a preview to where we're going with electrolytes, look at this table, see some of the symptoms that arise when diuretics cause electrolyte imbalances. So it's gonna cause depression, confusion, lethargy, coma, seizures, muscle cramps, arrhythmia. These are all things because these diuretics are affecting electrolyte levels. All of the following functions are carried out in the renal tubules, except filtration doesn't happen in the renal tubules. Filtration happens in the glomerulus. Tricky question. The ability to concentrate urine depends on the functions of, boy, I'd say the loop of Henle is probably the strongest at taking sodium and water out, so I'd say it's the loop of Henle. There are videos over GFR. So it's in three parts because back in the day, YouTube would only let me do 10 minute videos. There's a short little video a student asked me to do on the RAS system. And then there's a video on the PCT, which might provide additional information, but I don't know that it's absolutely necessary that you listen to that video. It's also in three parts. But you could click on those and listen to those. All right, the last thing we're gonna do is your analysis. And most of this is gonna be done in the lab. So the last thing is your analysis. We're gonna do a lot of this in the lab. The write-up 
so the lab is coming up in a in a slide that's coming up there's a few types of tests that i'll touch on briefly renal clearance is measured by following how long it takes the plasma to be cleared of a substance so inulin can be injected or the amount of creatinine in the blood can be used as a measure as well so I'm not going to go into these deeply um, that's why it's in green and italic so the math would be to ask the question how much of the substance is in the urine times the flow rate of urine divided by how much is known to be in the plasma so for example five grams of inulin can be injected and then the concentration of inulin in the blood can be measured by drawing blood and comparing that to how much is in the urine to get a clearance rate so clearance rates will be low if you have kidney failure creatinine is another mechanism but it's a little less accurate because you don't know how much is being made it's being made by metabolism but you don't know exactly how much is in there as you would when you inject inulin and when you inject five grams of inulin so essentially the amount of concentration of creatinine is measured in the blood and compared to how much is in the urine and you can kind of get an idea of renal clearance so I won't go through this one in any kind of great detail, but blood urea nitrate creatinine ratio is just one of those beautiful clinical tests where I think one of our big ideas in this class is to appreciate clinical testing. This one's clever because you have a normal amount, but then if the ratio goes higher, it means one thing, or if the ratio goes lower, it means another thing. So essentially what it comes down to is urea will leak out of the tubules, but creatinine, a breakdown product from muscles, won't. So if the amount of urea compared to creatinine is lower in urine, than it is in the blood, it means GFR is low and the urea had a lot of times to leak out. So again, the urea will leak out, creatinine cannot. So if there's very low urea compared to creatinine, it means the urea had time to leak out and so GFR is low. If the ratio of blood urea nitrate creatinine in urine is the same as in blood, it means that the kidneys are not getting rid of any creatinine. There's not any even going into the kidneys, so the kidneys are not doing any filtration. So a, a one to one ratio, actually a 20 to one ratio is what it normally is, would mean the kidneys aren't even getting any filtrate. If there's a little bit more blood urea nitrate creatinine than in blood, then that's what we would expect because we would expect blood urea nitrate and creatinine to be entering the filtrate. A small amount of the blood urea nitrate would be leaking out of the filtrate. So you'd have a basic equal ratio but a little bit less blood urea nitrate and that would what be what we would expect if on the other hand there's just a little bit more blood urea nitrate than creatinine that's what we would expect because we would expect a certain amount of blood urea nitrate and creatinine to enter the filtrate some of the blood urea nitrate leaks out because that's what it does in the kidney but only a little bit leaks out then that means everything's normal everything's going through at a rate where you're preventing a lot of the urea nitrate from leaking back but some of it's leaking back so it's one of those interesting ratios where a certain ratio is normal a higher ratio means something lower ratio means something you can isolate whether the problem is in the kidneys is before the kidneys or is after the kidneys so there should be about 10 times as much blood urea nitrate as creatinine in the urine and the reason that is is because the urea is leaking out if there's too much blood urea nitrate it means the kidneys are not filtering at all if there's too little blood urea nitrate it means it's leaked out of the tubules while creatinine stayed in so you get this idea that how fast the blood urea nitrate leaks out tells you if the problem is happening before the glomerulus within the kidney or if everything is normal I said I wasn't going to talk about this one much, but really is brilliant. So one final review. What I'm trying to state as simply as possible is blood urea nitrate leaks back into the blood. Creatinine does not. Thus, the ratio is a measurement of how much urea leakage occurs. GFR is low. A lot of leakage occurs, and the blood urea nitrate ratio goes up. If GFR is normal, the ratio is a 10 to 1. If no filtration is occurring, there's no leakage to make urea more concentrated in the blood, and you can tell that there's nothing going through the kidney. Sorry. We'll cover this one in the lab. Urine should be pale when properly hydrated. Cloudy urine might indicate an infection. Also, if your urine makes a lot of bubbles, for lack of a better word, it's frothy, then that could indicate protein loss. Urine should not really have a smell unless you've had asparagus recently, and even that's genetic. Not everybody's urine smells when they eat asparagus. Urine will convert to ammonia over time if it's sitting. Rather than go through things here, I might recommend you watch the video on urinalysis because that's where you go into more detail. 
I believe that clinical testing, understanding clinical testing is one of the big ideas in EAP. There's some cool things about urinalysis because it costs $2 to urinate on a stick and you can find all kinds of problems that could be going on. So you can get an idea of something's going on for very cheap. There's some different nuances to it. So for example, a pH value on its own on just one day is not going to tell you something. But if pH is consistently acidic, it might mean that you're having respiratory problems and you're holding on to too much CO2 and that's causing you to be acidic. Specific gravity doesn't tell you a whole lot, but again, if it's consistently very low, it could mean diabetes. Another cool thing about your analysis is it's not one individual value that generally matters, it's patterns. So there's a whole lot more detail than just normal versus abnormal. It's the combination of things that predict a structure. So we'll do this in lab. But for example, if you have glucose in your urine, that means you have diabetes mellitus. If you have glucose and ketones, it means you have diabetes mellitus and it's uncontrolled, so you're breaking it down in such a way that you're making ketones. Now let's say you have glucose, ketones, and protein. Well, that means that you're actually destroying the filtration membrane, that the glucose is destroying the filtration membrane, and so protein is making it into the filtrate when it shouldn't. So then this is a, a step in the advancement of diabetes mellitus. Let's go one step further. So if you have glucose, ketones, protein, and also blood cells, that would indicate that you're really damaging the kidneys with the diabetes. A problem with diabetes is sugar will crystallize. It'll form crystals. And when it does that in the kidneys, it destroys structures. It destroys the filtration membrane, and it can actually destroy the blood vessels too. So if you have glucose, ketones and proteins you're starting to destroy the filtration membrane if you have glucose ketones protein and blood you're really starting to advance the destruction because you're destroying blood vessels too and that's an advanced effect of the diabetes mellitus on the kidneys so it's the pattern other patterns are this bilirubin and urobilinogen one this is one of the most curious ones for me because it can tell you that you have a blockage of the common bile duct it can tell you that something's killing blood cells it can tell you that you have acute liver failure that you have chronic liver failure so it's the pattern between those two so normal is a little bit of urobilinogen and no bilirubin that's normal if you have more urobilinogen it means something's killing blood cells it's just an interesting test looking at the different combinations. So your analysis, again, it's just beautiful the way we've come up with these patterns that tell us just by urinating on a stick that you might have something you want to look deeper into. So it's cheap, easy, and might tell you something bad is happening. That's your analysis. And here's the write-up. There's a video on that called your analysis, which is there. So a major theme is you're going to come up with these connections and this is actually a test question so you're going to come up with 40 connections honestly you can do eight five-step connections or five eight-step connections you just need 40 connections with the minimum being a four-step connection if you want some extra credit you'll do 50 steps so again you could do one 50-step connection if you wanted to I've seen a 38-step connection before but you want to come up with 50 connections We've done several examples. There's one here with propofol from Michael Jackson. You can't use that one because that one's mine. But you're going to do that for the test. There will be a point where it's just like, oh, I won't say that these become fun, but they become interesting. And like I said, you can kind of get these off of the charts, but where I would like you to go is try and find real applications like students have that gave me the ones that we started this whole section with. So the student that had a brother that died of cardiac arrest, even though he had brain cancer, those kind of connections. There's more like if you have the flu, but you don't throw up, you kind of feel fatigued and you want to lay on the couch watching TV. But if you throw up, then you're going to lose acid. And that's going to lower acid levels, lower calcium levels, lower calcium levels cause you to cramp. So if you throw up a lot with the flu, now you're like cramping and you're sore and you're tired. You don't even want to watch TV. You just don't even want to get out of bed. Or if you do throw up, which one of the first things you want to get back is you want to get calcium back because calcium causes muscle cramping. Low calcium causes muscle cramping. So there's a lot in these connections. And that's why I say to you, even if you're not going into allied health, if you're not going into nursing, electrolytes can bring comfort to you. So, so if you're throwing up a lot, you're making yourself basic. You're making yourself alkalotic. The problem with that is low calcium can cause muscle cramping. So if you have the flu and you're throwing up a lot, one of the first things when you can take down food that you want to get back is calcium because calcium will decrease muscle cramping. Even something as simple as the different types of incontinence are interesting to look at for mastery level of thinking. There's a video on blood urea nitrate. You could explore kidney disease, CKD, 
um, chronic kidney disease and maybe look into urinalysis even more. All right, that's it. Thank you.